Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I am Keith Kucha. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at financial management, primarily the role of financial management, the basics of it, and budget requirements. I want to start off just by kind of warning or saying that in this video, it's just a lot of passing on of information. Really, we'll jump over to my Blackboard for me to be able to write and put on information as we go through. But there's not a ton that I can add by writing down. I'll be writing down key points. I'll be writing down kind of the key titles, kind of like, okay, that's a good kind of hint. These are big points to kind of consider. But if you just want to throw on the headphones, turn off the screen on YouTube and just listen to this as more of a podcast, feel free. You're not going to be missing out on a ton in terms of what's happening on the screen itself. Okay, what have we been talking about so far? So to date, we have evaluated, all day briefly, the role of legal authorities of government. From there, we moved on to evaluate the economic arguments for and against government intervention. Finally, last video series, we looked at at least one tool that was the cost-benefit analysis that can be used to determine if government intervention is warranted. That is, if government should go and put in a certain project or between competing projects, which one they ought to choose. Here, we're going to move on into, well, as the title suggests, budgeting. While some economists might actually argue against government budgeting, um, we must recognize that, hey, there is actually an importance in the process. And really, this whole budgeting and financial management is quite actually important to the public sector, at least as a tool to control and allocate these scarce resources, right? Primarily taxation revenue and the money, the capital money that goes with that. Uh, why might some uh, why might some economists actually argue against a budgeting approach to determining policy and program implementation? Well, we'll circle back to this. This will kind of come up throughout the videos. Uh, second video, we'll take a look specifically at different types of budgets and we'll see the problems with them. Kind of getting back to that. But implicitly, we've already actually answered this question in our previous video on the cost benefit analysis. That being said, this video will evaluate financial management side of government, focusing on budgeting and reporting. And throughout, we will also answer that question a bit more clearly as to why some economists actually argue against a budget approach. By the end of this video, uh, you'll be able to actually recognize that, hey, this whole financial management process is just a big circle. So it has a big circular flow to it. We'll take a look at that. We'll also be able to explain the budget cycle and different types of budgets that exist and the differences in budgeting requirements based off of our level of government. That is the difference between our federal, our provincial, and our local levels of government. That's this video. In the next video, that's Financial Management 2, we will evaluate the different types or the different techniques to budgeting. And then in the third video, Financial Management 3, we will be taking a look at reporting requirements. So that being said, let's jump over to our Blackboard screen and let's begin. Okay, so ultimately government must weigh the burden of taxes and these charges against people, right? So the levies and all of that against the benefits of the services that they provide. So yes, they end up providing services through the infrastructure, through say parks and recreation, uh, through sewage, all of these different services that governments provide. These are bonuses. These are great benefits to society. But of course, these must be weighed against the burden of taxation and charges. So budgeting is one way to kind of really look and at and control for that. Financial management thus, which is part of our whole budgeting process, is then an essential aspect of government. Now, it involves staff from every department. That is, there's not necessarily just one department of the budget. Every department, every ministry, every program is responsible for in this whole budgeting process. So it's quite extensive and typically at most levels of government happens annually. The process itself is circular in nature, as we've already alluded to, and can be simplified down really to three components. And let's graphically show this. Again, I did that warning like, hey, you're not missing much if you're just listening to this uh, on headphones and not looking at the screen. You're really not. I can paint a picture verbally as to what's happening pretty simply here. So what we have, if we were to take a look at this, is we have kind of our first step to our financial management is the budget. So that is our budgeting process. 
We'll take a look at some of the regulations around budgeting as we move on through this video, uh, through this video as promised. In the next video, as promised, we'll take a look at actually some techniques of budgeting. From budgeting, that is essentially our plan, we then move on into accounting. And we'll talk about what we mean by accounting and what exactly is happening in accounting. Uh, once we get this all through, we'll talk about each one in its so right. From accounting, well, accounting ultimately just feeds into reporting. And again, we'll evaluate what we mean by that shortly. And from reporting, well, we then use those reports, the information that comes from those reports to then go and create next year's budget. So again, that whole circular flow of it is we create a budget, we then collect data as to what's actually happening. That data then goes into a report. That report then gives us the information we need to then draft next year's budget and then rinse, wash, repeat as we go around and around and around. So let's go through and define each of these three terms. So again, those three terms are budgeting, accounting, and reporting. So starting off with budget. Uh, what do we mean by budget? Well, as was already alluded to, a budget is just a plan. In this case here, it is a method to organize and plan financial obligations in an orderly manner. To put it maybe another way, Budgeting is a statement of financial expectations. So, hey, this is what we expect our financial obligations to be over some future period of time. Maybe it's over the next month. Maybe it's over the next year. It's just a plan. Uh, there's many different ways, uh, techniques, and methods to ultimately create this budget. If you've ever created a personal budget, you've likely used some of these just by default, even without any training or anything like that. Again, in the second video, we will end up evaluating five main types of budgets. These five types, just for reference, so hey, the names are at least somewhat familiar. We're not going to get into the details here. That's, of course, coming up. But these five types are going to be line item budgets, performance budgets, program budgets. Uh, this one's a big one. Planning program budget system budgets. And finally, a zero-based budget. So... We'll take a look at each of those. We'll talk about their pros. We'll talk about their cons, what works well, what doesn't work well as we move on into our next video. Well, that's the budgeting side, right? So budgeting, essentially right now, we're just going to say, hey, budgeting, that's our plan. This is our plan as to how we're going to spend our money. Uh, what's, what's that next term there? That next term was accounting. Uh, what do we mean by accounting? Well, Honestly, we're not going to spend much time here. This really is the realm of accountants. This is really where our accountants exist, really a specialty to focus in on. And it's why we have, well, your four plus year degree between your studying and then your practicing, et cetera, in order to become an accountant. Well, really what we're going to classify this as in order to kind of simplify it is that really accounting is just drawing on many different techniques to gather, classify, and record financial information. So let's just write those three things down there. So accounting is to gather, so that's your data collection, classify, figuring out, hey, we got all this information about where money was spent. We're going to classify that, hey, this money is classified underneath this subheading, this money is classified underneath that one. And then finally, gather, classify, and record. Or we could say, I just don't want to use the same word twice, uh, report, right? But report, that's getting into our next step. So I just want to use record here. So gather, going out, collecting, getting that information, classifying it, figuring out where it all fits in the jigsaw puzzle, and then recording it is putting it all in its right spots and working out the summations and all the parts of that. All together, this allows us to report the information to the relevant decision makers. So. That being said, not to overly simplify the role of accountants, definitely extremely important in this whole process, but beyond the scope of what we're looking at by far. So let's jump over and take a look at our third part of this financial management circle, which is reporting. So what's going on with reporting? Well, reporting is just the communication of the accounting information. Uh, to policymakers, right? Not just to anybody, but the reporting of that accounting information to policymakers. What we have to keep in mind is that we can't just go and 
throw all the raw data, all that raw accounting information at the policymakers, uh, the politicians or the uh, deputy ministers or the ministers who are responsible for making decisions, they might not be fully trained in interpreting and understanding all these reports to the same degree that accountants are. So that being said, this information must be presented in a way such that the key information is summarized and presented in timely, relevant, and most importantly, in an understandable fashion, right? In such a way that kind of a layman could more or less understand it. And not to say that policymakers are laymen, but that, right, the normal constituent, the normal member of the public could also access this information and understand really what is happening within their government. So it just helps to ensure the transparency of government as well. Of course, really the big purpose of this is to allow for effectual evaluation of results. That is, hey, we put in a plan, our budget, we've now looked at the results of this and we can say, hey, did it actually work? This then helps to fuel our decision making. And really the cool thing with this is with modern computing and all modern connectivity, this often means that this reporting is done in real time and not just real time, but real time and online access, like anywhere in the world, smashing that space time continuum. Uh, the amazing thing of our current technology world, right? Beyond this, right, we are going to have the real line, the, sorry, the real time online reporting. You're also going to have above and beyond that your periodic detailed and summary reports. So yes, as the information comes in, you might have a real time dashboard for policymakers to review. Beyond that, you're also going to create your periodic detailed reports that include summaries. This perhaps could be quarterly saying, hey, yeah, sure, you saw the real time stuff, but let's aggregate all of this into a quarterly big picture and summarize it for convenience of reading. And then finally, we'll also include our year end statements. So, hey, yeah, we saw the real time, you saw the quarterly, we're going to aggregate this all again and take a look at this year end total and see where we finished off the financial period. All of this, right, to tie this all back into the circular flow, we see that, hey, of course, this reporting, this year end statement, this understanding as to where our plan kind of ended up. Well, all of this gives us information to then draft next year's plan. So, hey, we then create next year's plan. That's a budget. We create that budget. We then collect data as to how we're doing on that budget. How well are we actually meeting the goals laid out in that plan? That accounting information gets reported. That reported information then goes into the ability to create next year's plan, next year's budget. So again, just to really beat the importance there, uh, to beat the understanding of that circular flow of financial management. Right. Well, with that circular flow of financial management then understood, uh, the circular flow is roughly going to be identical irrespective of the level of government that we are evaluating. However, there are going to be differences in budgeting requirements or legal frameworks based off of different legislation or yeah, different legislation that's been put in place at the federal, provincial, and local levels. So let's go take a look at budgeting requirements at each of these levels of government. Again, keeping in mind our three levels of government in Canada, we have up at the top, we have our federal level of government, that is the government of Canada overseeing the entire nation. Below the federal level is our provincial level, uh, we have all of our provinces and territories within our great nation. However, we are living in the province of British Columbia, BC. So, of course, when we are evaluating the provincial level, our focus will, of course, be on BC and taking a look at what are the provincial legislations that affect budgeting. Finally, our lowest level of government is our local level of government. And to distinguish, again, to rather remind ourselves of the distinguishing factors of local, we have both municipal levels of government, so that is our actual cities, towns, etc., as well as we have our regional districts. Uh, these regional districts often encompassing both rural and urban centers together. Again, here, we're living in Canada, that's our federal level. We're living in BC, that's our provincial level. Uh, thus, what we're going to look at is when we move down to the local level is rules and legislation that affect local governments in the province of British Columbia. Uh, as we already saw earlier, 
there is nothing in our Constitution Act that even kind of sets out rules or anything about the existence of municipalities or local governments. All of these are thus determined and legislated at the provincial level. And same with any budgeting requirements. So let's uh, go through these. Let's start off, of course, right at the top with our federal with our federal level of government. So the government of Canada. So, okay, for the government of Canada, really what we're gonna take a look at is our Constitution Act. So the Constitution of 1867. And really taking a look at that, it does not actually require any regular budgets. Uh, there's nothing in our Constitution Act that says, hey, federal government, you must pass a budget every year. Uh, instead, all that it really says is that government is required to debate publicly, so in the House of Commons, any bill requiring either imposition of taxes and levies or an appropriation of public funds. So essentially, any bill that's going to change the rate of taxation, taking more money from the people, or any bill that's going to require public funds, spending of the people's money, these bills need to be debated publicly. So really, the government would have two choices. They could either do this piecewise every time they want to update minister or some ministry spending, some department spending, say, hey, we want to go through and buy a whole bunch of new battleships for the Royal Canadian Navy. Well, if that was the case, we would bring that specific bill before Parliament, we would debate it, and we would work out what we're going to spend and how much maybe taxation is a change in order to finance it. And this has to be done every time there is a budget or sorry, a spending kind of proposal being made. Alternatively, for simplicity, what is actually done, and this has become the norm, is just for the government to present and pass an annual budget. And right here's the big thing. There's no requirement for them to pass this annual budget. It's just become the norm. That is the thing that we would typically do. In this case, typically the federal government prov uh, presents the annual budget in February, although, right, there's no requirement. This could be moved around based off of their uh, desires, based off of their needs. And this annual budget, it really outlines all of their plans for expenditure over the year, like, hey, we're going to spend this much money on national defense. We're going to spend this much money on parks. We're going to spend this much money on service, service, serve, right? All the different aspects of our federal expenditure. Then they need to work out, okay, where is this revenue going to come from? So, hey, this is going to be the source of revenue. Some of it's going to be tied to specific spending. Some of it's just going to be into that general revenue that's just going to fund things on whole. But this appropriation of public funds through taxation, this spending of public funds, all of that is debated through this kind of omnibus budget. That is all of these individual little spending bills all put together in an annual budget. So under the Westminster style of government, that is the style of government that we have adopted from the United Kingdom, from England, um, different to uh, realms I just referred to there, but from England, the Westminster style of government really has in it that budgets and any bills of spending are really confidence items. Uh, what we mean by these confidence items is that if the government fails to pass these items, that is you have more members of parliament voting against them than you have voting for them, we would say that there has been a loss of confidence in the government. If ever there's a loss of uh, confidence in the government, it triggers a dissolution of the government and the government needs to return to the polls, return to the people, hold another election in order to regain a new mandate. Now, in this case here, as we said, budget, bills of spending are confidence items, meaning every time the federal government, and actually technically provincial government too, brings up a budget or any bill of spending, if they fail to get these passed, they essentially fail to maintain government. They will have to dissolve. So just a little bit of an addition in that. Let's jump over to the provincial government now. So the provincial government, uh, again, keep in mind that the Constitution Act of 1867, it really laid out the rules, the authorities of both the federal and provincial level. That is, again, the Constitution Act, it actually does not necessitate any provincial budgets, just the same as with the federal level, right? They say, okay, yep, you need to go and you need to debate in the legislature. So that's the provincial equivalent of parliament is the legislature, with the exception of Ontario, but We'll ignore them. Uh, at the provincial legislature, you have to uh, debate 
any bills that result in spending of public funds or changes in taxation and levies and charges, right? Same as that federal level. So again, Norm had that, yes, because of this, we go and we create annual budgets. And for a long time, provincially, that was it. It was just Norm, just like at the federal level. Then in the year 2000, the BC government implemented the BC Transparency and Accountability Act of 2000. What this BC Transparency and Accountability Act did, and just to summarize here, there's a lot to it, is it set requirements. It set requirements that now the provincial government was held to for budget preparation. So what were the steps to prepare a budget? When did the preparation process need to start? What needed to be done during this preparation process? It then also set out requirements for the presentation of the budget and what needed to be included within that budget, as well as room for this budget to be debated and adopted. Uh, what we're going to look at specifically here, though, is the areas around this legislation, that is the BC Transparency and Accountability Act, around the preparation and presentation of this budget. So starting off with preparation. Uh, with preparation, this whole process of preparing the budget must begin by the 15th of September. So 15th of September is when the whole process must begin, when the Minister of Finance makes a public budget consultation paper. So Minister of Finance releases this public consultation paper, uh, budget consultation paper, sorry. And this budget consultation paper must include three aspects. Uh, the first one is a fiscal forecast of key economic variables. So this is gonna be things like Hey, what is our provincial GDP, gross domestic product? What is the provincial unemployment rate? Uh, what is going to be our rate of inflation within the province? Um, by no ways is that an exhaustive list, just some examples of some key economic variables that would be of importance. Uh, fiscal forecast would be the expected spending of the government. So, for example, hey, this is going to be our forecast expenditure for the Ministry of Health, for the Ministry of Education, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, additionally, what also needs to be included is, okay, yes, this fiscal forecast and key economic variables, but also any assumptions that went into this forecast. So, of course, anytime you're forecasting, anytime you're predicting into the future, certain assumptions need to be made. So, this list of assumptions needs to be included as well. Second item. Second item that needs to be included in this public uh, budget consultation paper is a summary of the key issues which the government wants to address. So, hey, I don't know, let's suppose the government is really concerned about housing. Well, if that is actually a concern of theirs, they need to say, hey, this is a key issue that we want to address in our next budget. If they're really concerned about health care, this is something we're concerned about. This is something we want to address in our next budget. So all of these key issues are going to be addressed. They're going to be listed out as saying these are our concerns as your government, as your representatives. So again, part one, fiscal forecast of economic variables. Part two, summary of key issues. Part three, hey public, that is you and I, the constituents, here is some information on how you can provide your government feedback. Say you don't see a key issue that you feel is a key issue presented. Well, this is where you can speak to your government and you can say this needs to be addressed. Or you see something there, you're like, I, I really don't think that's an issue. Again, you can reach out into the budget process and you can say, I feel that this should be reached at. Uh, sorry, I feel that this should be addressed. I feel that this should be looked at. And so room for public feedback, room to get kind of an idea as to what the public's key issues actually are. Okay, that's the preparation side. So three aspects, fiscal forecast, summary of key issues, and information on how the public can get involved. 15th of September is when that needs to be provided. All the process then goes through and actually creating the actual budget. So compiling the public feedback, compiling, okay, yes, this is where we think everything is. These are our key issues. How are we going to address these key issues? All of that. Okay, we figured it out. We must now present the budget. So actually bring it up in legislature for debate. This must happen by the third Tuesday 
in February. So right, not a fixed date in this case here, but by the third Tuesday in February. And then just like that public budget consultation paper had key things that must be included, we have again said that the presentation of the budget must similarly include key elements. And there's a few more here. Uh, some of them are just kind of carry forwards, but there's a few big parts here. So first, the uh, budget, it must include um, proposed budget appropriations. So, hey, what are we going to be spending our money on? Where are we going to be getting our tax revenue from, etc. cetera? Uh, we must also include a statement of our forecasted expenditures and revenues. So, okay, first step was, hey, these are our expected current expenditures and revenues. Next part is a statement of our forecasted future expenditures and revenues, as well as how these expenditures and revenues are going to impact our deficit or surplus. Again, keep in mind, what does that mean? A deficit, uh, again, going to write stuff down, but don't worry, not too much. A deficit is just any time where your expenditures are greater than your revenues. That is, you spend more money than you made. Alternatively, our surplus, uh, surplus is just when you have made more money than you have expended. So that is your revenues exceed your expenditures. So, okay, that needs to be forecasted as well. Next part, just building off of that previous one, there needs to be a reconciliation of the surplus or deficit. So surplus or deficit is just current period. This needs to be reconciled with the change in debt. So you can imagine if you're running a surplus, that is you're kind of saving, well, that savings is paying down the existing debt. If you ran a deficit, that is you spent more money than you brought in, the only way you can spend more money is by borrowing. So that borrowing has added to the debt. So there needs to be that reconciliation of present period surplus deficit with the total outstanding debt altogether. Next thing that needs to be included is, of course, a forecasted balance sheet for the end of fiscal year. So list of all the assets, list of all the liabilities. And then this is carrying forward kind of an updated version from our budget consultation paper. It needs to include an economic and fiscal forecast, again, including our assumptions. So these are our key economic variables. These are our key areas of spending. That's our fiscal forecast, our key expectations for taxation revenue, and all the relevant assumptions. Finally, a little tack on here is the budget must also include any and all capital commitments in excess of $50 million. So some key aspects there of the budget and what must be included in that. Again, we talked about them as we went through, but just a quick list again. Proposed budget appropriations, statement of forecasted expenditures and revenues, as well as whether or not you're going to be running a current period deficit or a surplus reconciliation of that surplus and deficit with the change in debt, forecasted balance sheet for the end of the fiscal year, Economics, uh, economic forecast of key variables, as well as the fiscal forecast, including assumptions, and then finally, capital commitments in excess of 50 million. Don't get too caught up on this, right? It's not going to be like a quiz question because there isn't a quiz. But just to kind of keep in mind, okay, there are requirements as to what the BC government must publish, must include in their mandate. That is big thing, right? Our federal government, pretty loose, a lot of freedom, a lot of autonomy in how they draft their budgets. BC has imposed on itself kind of a best practice of, hey, a bit more restriction. This is what you have to do. Now, you can do more than that, of course, but at minimum, these conditions must be met. Okay, we're not done yet. There's more restrictions still put on the provincial government, at least in BC. So additional, uh, additionally, in addition to everything we've just listed, wow, I just can't find another synonym for that word, um, the government also needs to outline their key priorities. So, hey, these are the key priorities that we have. Hey, that was also kind of outlined in that public budget consultation paper. Well, they're reiterating these in their budget. What they're also going to put in this is their objectives. So, hey, my priority is housing. My objective for housing is to create X many new affordable housing units. And then, of course, they also need to include, so the priority, the objective, and a performance measure. 
saying, hey, yeah, this was our priority. This is how we're going to meet that priority. And this is how you can hold us accountable. Hey, look at this. Look at this performance measure. Did we meet it? Are we actually being an effectual government or are we not? So again, a great thing put in there so we can really kind of measure the effectiveness of our government. Um, above and beyond this is also kind of the government's forecast of these estimates for the next two fiscal years. So kind of where they see themselves moving towards their objectives and towards meeting these performance measures. That way they're, you know, they say, hey, we think we'll get 50% towards our target in two years time. Well, in two years time, we can look at that and we can evaluate and we can hold the government to account. If we remember, eh, it turns out us constituents often have a pretty short memory, but at least it's all there. That provides at least the media the ability to kind of help us to hold the government to account, ideally at least. Okay, what else? We're still not done. Uh, above and beyond that, individual government ministers, so these are all the different ministries and departments, they also need to make a public service plan. So saying, hey, here I am, deputy of the minister of finance, or uh, the minister of finance rather, Deputy would be serving underneath uh, him or her, but Minister of Finance, this is my service plan. This is what I expect to do as the Minister of Finance for the next year. And not just that, this is what I expect to do for the next three years. So this is my current and my next three year service plan. And this needs to be done for every ministry. So, right, really detailed. Every ministry needs to have these are my goals, these are my objectives. This is how you can hold me accountable accountable and this is what it's going to look like over the next three years still not done still not done since 2003 2004 so okay keep in mind all these restrictions were put in in a 2000 act so a few years later the provincial government added on this additional mandate and this additional mandate in 0304 i'm just writing down those dates just because uh, we had an additional mandate that the provincial government must run a balanced budget. That is that they could not run a budget deficit. In fact, they really, really put their money where their mouth is here. They said, hey, if the government ever runs a budget deficit, the cabinet, the executive council, so that'd be the premier and all of his or her ministers, they would, they would face the cost personally. And not that they would finance that deficit, that'd be ridiculous, but they would face a 20% clawback in their salaries. So that's substantial, right? That's one fifth of their salary clawed back if they run a deficit. Now, a bit of opinion time, I'm gonna digress a little bit from the, uh, from the lesson plan, from our learning outcomes, but this is really where some criticism comes in. This seems like a great idea when we're talking about personal finance, right? On a personal finance level, it's like, yes, deficits are bad. You're spending more money than you're bringing in. But that's because on a personal finance level, your spending does not, well, it does, but you don't have enough power for your spending to directly impact the economy, to change economic outcomes. The government spending does. So in this sense here, by forcing the government to only have a surplus or a balanced budget, you are in essence saying to the government, you cannot engage in certain spending and certain activities because it's just too much in this year. And the decision makers, the executive council, they're the ones hurt by these decisions. So they have no incentive to undertake these kind of, to undertake these kind of policies. So for example, going back, and this is gonna be kind of talking about what we had hinted at earlier about kind of why some economists are not a big fan of budgeting is because let's say we had, we had this massive infrastructure project. I mean, if it's not known, most of the Western world, um, most of the Western world here in the West, especially, we have crumbling public infrastructure, uh, roads, bridges, tunnels, et cetera. Um, there's definitely places where it's a lot worse, but not to underestimate what's happening here. Okay, so let's say we've run the cost benefit analysis and we say, yes, massive infrastructure spending is needed, massive upgrades are needed, and the net 
benefit to society, that net social benefit is large, meaning that, hey, the cost benefit analysis has come back and said, this is a good thing. This is something we really should be spending our money on. Okay. Problem is, despite the fact, and keep in mind when you're running a cost benefit analysis, in the cost side is included the cost of funds. That is, if you had to borrow money, the cost of borrowing that money is included. Okay, you go and you put this in, and it's just too much in order to actually finance this in a budget. It's just way too much money. It cannot happen. And so your executive council has no desire to make it happen because they're personally going to get hit. So what do they do? Well, they either A, push it down the road, say, okay, yes, this infrastructure spending needs to, be ha needs to happen. We recognize that. Unfortunately, we don't have the fiscal capacity to do it today. Alternatively, they look for cheaper alternative options rather than doing the actual infrastructure upgrades that are needed. Maybe there's a way to kind of push it off partly onto the private sector. Maybe we can get away with a cheaper option. Instead of making a new six-lane bridge, maybe, right? A six-lane bridge that would kind of meet forecasted capacity for the next decade. Maybe we only just build a four-lane bridge that just meets current demand, current capacity. Because, hey, at least we're doing something. We're fixing aging infrastructure, but we're doing it in a budget-conscious manner. You kind of see the problem with that, right? Okay. So I digressed a little bit to kind of took a look at that uh, conflict there between budgets and uh, kind of a cost benefit analysis version of just the uh, public spending. Keep in mind, they do both have their place. Cost benefit analysis, as well as budgeting in terms of allocation of public funds. Let's jump over to the local government. Our final form of government here, the smallest form of government, this would be our municipalities and our regional districts. Uh, unlike the federal and the provincial level, these guys are not captured underneath the Constitution Act. So there's nothing in the Constitution about these local levels of government. In fact, the entire authority of the local government rests in really the whims of the provincial government. Thus, the whole budgeting process at the local level is controlled by the senior levels of government, primarily the province. In BC, this is set out in our Provincial Community Charter. I'll uh, write that down. Our Provincial Community Charter. Uh, well, it's a quite a large charter kind of outlining the authorities and the rules that govern our local municipalities and regional districts. The two sections of interest to us right here are section 165 and 166. Uh, you can find links to these if you wanted to look them up farther. They're on page 62 of the course text. Um, to kind of summarize the key points of these two sections, um, they're really establishing the requirements for local government financial planning. Uh, in that, they lay out that our city councils or our regional district councils, they must enact an annual bylaw that adopts really your budget, your plan, your financial plan for the current period, well, at least your upcoming period, as well as the next four years. That is, annually, council must create a five-year plan saying, hey, this is what we plan to do today, and then being a little bit forward thinking, this is what we plan to do over the next four years as well. So these five-year plans must be adopted annually. Additionally, just like the province, these financial plans must balance. In this case here, again, just the plan, your budget, an actual deficit or surplus is a different thing, right? Just very rarely do budgets survive first contact. As soon as things start happening, the accounting, the reporting, you go, oh, we plan to run a balanced budget, but unfortunately we ran a deficit due to these unforeseen expenses. Or we plan to run a balanced budget, but look at this, we ran a surplus due to these unforeseen revenues. Yay. Okay. So we must at least plan to run a balanced budget. That is no deficit, no surplus. If, if the municipality does end up running a deficit, that is, oh no, unexpected uh, expenses or your revenues weren't as great as you expected them to be, well, this deficit needs to be carried forward as a cost in your next year's budget. 
That is, right, keep this in mind, we're dealing with scarce resources. So if all of a sudden we need to now have a cost in the next year's plan of our carry forward deficit, that's money going towards this cost that is now not going towards other programs and services. So now that's money not going towards parks, not going towards recreation, not going towards sewage, waste management, et cetera, et cetera. If, however, the municipality or regional district were to run a surplus, that's great. That money is then available to them as a surplus, but there's no need to carry it forward into the next year's plans, right? You don't need to carry this forward as extra revenue. You don't need to carry this forward as a negative cost or something weird like that. It's just there as part of your kind of accrued capital, right? Part of your, uh, part of your capital, we'll say. So there's that aspect there. I just want to highlight again that whole fact that if you run a deficit, that deficit must be kind of remediated in the near future as a cost in the next year's plans. Um, and again, the fact that, hey, we live in a world of scarcity. Scarcity means we make choices. Choices mean opportunity costs. So right again, by having that deficit, we incur that cost. That is money that we now have to choose to put towards that cost. That is money that now cannot be used towards other things. Again, from the point of view here, the argument would be the difficulty in using this as a budgeting framework versus just a cost benefit analysis saying, yes, we're borrowing money. Yes, we're running a deficit, but it's because the gains to society are so great that the cost of this deficit, the cost of this borrowing is worth it. Underneath this framework, where we're not allowed to run deficits, it means that we're going to forego certain programs. We're going to forego certain elements of government intervention that might have been that might have been beneficial to society. Again, it seems here like I'm kind of pro-deficit, pro-massive amount of government spending. That's not at all the case. I'm just cautious, I'm a little bit hesitant of these legislations put into place that prevent deficits because ultimately debt and deficits are a tool. They're amoral, they're neither good nor bad. They can be used in bad ways, but they can also be used in good ways. And thus restricting them can be problematic. And that's really the point I'm trying to make. Okay, so what have we looked at in this video? We started off by evaluating the circular flow, uh, the circular nature rather, of financial management. That was that whole flow from budgeting to accounting to reporting and then using that updated reporting information to draft next period's budget. From there, we then went and took a look at the different legal frameworks at different levels of government. Starting off at the federal level that has the most autonomy, essentially they don't even have to run a budget if they don't want to. They can just pass individual spending bills one at a time without the budget. Down to the provincial level, which since the year 2000 has mandated kind of steps towards the preparation and presentation of that budget. Again, to reiterate, that is that the budget must begin to be prepared through this public consultation by the 15th of September, and then it must be presented by the third Tuesday in February. Additional things was the 0304 additional mandate thrown on that, that the provincial budget must be balanced. They could not run deficits. And that kind of tack on that if the government ever did run a deficit, the costs of that were going to be felt by the executive council. And that is through a 20% reduction in their pay. Um, I just want to add on a little thing there. Given the pandemic, right? COVID-19 pandemic, so launching off in the year 2020, flowing through, just recently starting to ease come 2022, the provincial government in BC did run actual sizable deficits in order to stimulate the economy and in order to help people through the difficulties of the pandemic. What was done in this case, because it was seen as this was like an emergency measure, like something that needed to be done, is this 0304 mandate restricting deficits was actually amended. And it was amended to allow this emergency pandemic relief without clawing back executive council salaries. So, right, and this is the big thing, is when you're the government and you get to make the laws, it means you can also change the laws uh, when you want. And so, in this case here, it was saying, yes, we still want to maintain this mandate of having no deficits. However, we're going to recognize that this is an emergency. So we're going to make a quick amendment 
to kind of look the other way for this short period of time. Beyond this, where are we going next? Well, in the next video, we're going to evaluate different types of budgeting. So different techniques, different methods in engaging budgeting. We've already introduced those five, uh, the five different methods. We will talk about and look at each one in the next video and talk about the pros and cons of each one. In the third video, all together, this uh, week's viewings are going to be split up into our three videos. This one, our budgeting techniques and methods. And the final one, we're going to be looking at our legal framework of our reporting. So this one was really our legal framework of the budget. The last video will be the legal framework of our reporting requirements. And again, by each level of government, federal, provincial, and local. Okay, well, if you had any questions or comments on anything covered in this video, please feel free to reach out to me, post in the comments below, reach out on the D2L thread, or of course, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.